and two in the book. One of them was about some of the confusion between cooperation, collaborations, and groupthink. You talked about groupthink and the blind spots that can go undetected when uh-huh. dissent is not tolerated. Talk about groupthink. I think that's really important in terms of understanding the difference between a successful team and people that are just banded together in a group. Well, exactly. Groupthink is an interesting thing. And uh, I think to put it in really simple clothes, it's, it's like the emperor's uh, new clothes story. Um, if an organization does not allow space for a dissenting opinion, and I don't mean just a team pessimist constantly putting out negativity, but I mean really taking a careful look at how they make decisions and how they grow the company and the direction. It's real easy for those who want to stay employed to simply follow the people in power without telling the truth, (laughs) without sharing their opinion, without knowing that the direction they're headed is a catastrophe. And um, we see them come up from time to time in the news as whistleblowers. They've had these conversations within their organization, have been ignored, and the company has plunged ahead either doing illegal things or doing unethical things or just doing things poorly that result in the demise of the organization, the demise of the company. So group think is, is also, I think it's almost like cult thinking because if... You can't dissent. Yeah, if leaders are trying to um, get their way and they shame, intimidate, isolate um, people who have dissenting opinions, then that is true blown groupthink. I had an interesting experience with this at age 26, where a Canadian telecom company came to the U.S. to revolutionize an industry. And I could tell their culture Uh for getting this venture manifested was to induce fear. They were franchising this concept and they were inducing tremendous fear that they would take over the industry and run everybody out of business. They were unable to take feedback and they were not receptive to people, even their model franchises, the input. And I remember writing an extensive letter to the president explaining that while the concept was great, if they didn't look at the following things and the way their corporate culture was operating that it would implode in on itself. Yes. And I was culturally dismissed from that venture. I was there when they started this new venture. I was dismissed, meaning I was disregarded. I stayed in the venture, and it turns out that two years later, $25 million later, they were closed down. And the very thing I had said that I had seen that I tried to explain to them early on before they were told by Canada, you have to get out of the U.S. market right now. You know, 100 families had to move back to Canada. But, I mean, lives were disrupted. It was a fascinating venture. But they could not take the feedback of what wasn't working on a cultural level. And their method was command and control and takeover. I think you're talking about groupthink maybe on a different level from the inside, right? But I saw it happen. I saw it happen at 26, and I could see it now anywhere I go in any organization that I'm communicating with or seeing. Well, and you will see, you see a lot of group think in command and control structures because you have an extreme centralized power base that is going to direct the operations, uh, the culture of the company the way they see fit. And if there is no room for learning, (laughs) groupthink occurs. And in learning organizations, you see it very, very, very infrequently. Uh, The only time I really see it in a learning organization is through cult marketing, where um, uh, the sense of belonging, the sense of uh, being a committed and creative uh, person with opportunities uh, is manipulated. 
What does that mean in cult marketing? Um, a cult marketing would be uh, uh, creating an organization or creating a team around a specific concept. And again, any dissension, then you are publicly um, dismissed. Uh, you're threatened with your belonging, et cetera. And I've seen this. I'm seeing this more frequently in uh, uh, some of the groups that form business development groups and associations. I think I know what you're referring to. I see it too. We won't mention them, but I think we know what they are and who they are. Yes. I've had experience with those entities as well, and I've also given my feedback and had to walk away. But you know what, Diane? I call these organizations self-referential organizations. That's the essence of a cult-like system. It cannot take feedback from the outside. It cannot hear anything it doesn't want to hear. It must dismiss or destroy whatever message is coming in that's not what it wants to hear. Right. And and that, I think, when we see it in, in organizations, whether it's in automobile manufacturing, airplane and manufacturing, NASA, uh, or just the simple little barbershop downtown, uh, when you see uh, this sort of, uh, I'm going to say, abusive use of power, yes. um, then groupthink is, is full-blown. And we, we do see that <laughs> news is filled, I think, frequently with examples of groupthink. Have you ever heard of D. Hawk? Yes. Founder of Visa, and he wrote the book One From Many? Yes. He has another translation of a chaotic organization that's very interesting as well, and I think that it would be interesting to have you both on one day. <laughs> I would enjoy Together. that. I would enjoy that. That would be awesome. You are traveling a lot? Are you doing your trainings by teleconference or by webinars, or how are you doing most of your training right now? Well, I, I, web, web conferencing and teleconferences are the best way I know to get good information out to people from all over the globe. We're finding that uh, there's a real interest in emerging uh, countries toward the, the team culture theory. I think they've been able to stand aside and look at what works in business and what doesn't, and clearly the team culture um, is of high interest to them. So the way to, to reach folks that are in India or in China or in Malaysia is through the teleconference process. Um, but we sure certainly do not turn down any opportunity to speak to uh, local groups and associations. In fact, we love the opportunity to share. One of the great leaders and tigers among us who has passed on was Anita Roddick, who I'm sure you know about very well, the founder of The Body Shop. Mm -hmm. And as I read your book, many times her image came to mind as somebody who instilled the tiger's principles. People loved working for her organization and came in droves. Really, it was one of the biggest organizations in the world, like Visa. I know she was a controversial figure and an activist and a business owner and grew one of the biggest companies. But when I read Tigers Among Us, it reminded me of her, it reminded me of Dr. Muhammad Yunus of the Grameen Bank. And he has really grown Grameen through not only using the Tigers' values, but really being a humanitarian at the workplace. Well, and you can be. I mean, I think that when you have... Again, it's not as though a company has to embrace the tiger's values, but you will see the tigers, uh, good, healthy tigers, um, emerge from organizations that have an authentic team culture. And <clears throat> one of the things that, uh, that happens when empathy has a reverence in the workplace, it has a place, what you're going to see is kindness. What you're going to see are leaders and employees who have the capacity and desire the capacity to put themselves into somebody else's shoes to understand them. What you all also find is that there tends to be a high level of social responsibility that occurs in these workplaces because people, again, can bring all of who they are um, to the workforce and have it embraced. I have a question to you about people's relationship to giving their ideas away. A lot of people, rightly or wrongly, 